This is CBS 13 News at 6. From the ground, it's video you'll, you'll only see on 13. Flames from a fire that started near train tracks, then leaping into a campground. From the air, pictures sent to CBS 13 show just how far the flames spread in Old Orchard Beach and Saco this afternoon. Good evening, I'm Kim Block. And I'm Greg Lagerquist. We have team coverage on that serious fire along the tracks in Saco and Old Orchard Beach. We'll have that in just a moment. But first, he's accused of dismembering his father, and court documents reveal gruesome new details. Investigators say Leroy Smith III killed his father, Leroy Smith Jr., on Saturday. Police found the body on Monday. Tonight, Smith III is talking exclusively from jail with CBS 13's John Crisos. John? And Kim, late this afternoon, Smith decided he wanted to talk to us against the advice of his lawyer. So we came here to the jail with our camera and questions. Smith was actually very polite, calm, and ready to share his story of what he says happened Saturday when he killed his father. Let's take you inside the jail in this room. Leroy Smith III confessed to me that he killed his father, who he called Junior, his father, Leroy Smith II. He went into some graphic details about the three knives he used in that killing. He said his father was an evil man who sexually abused him. That has not been proven, but he told police the same thing. We discovered that in court documents. Smith says he got kicked out of his apartment in Massachusetts in December and had nowhere else to go, so he moved in with his father in Gardner. Less than six months later, he says he killed him. You said your dad sexually assaulted you your whole life. Why did you move in with him? I, society gave me no choice. I, 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 I sit on the outskirts of society, trying my hardest just to get people's attention so I can have a life, and no one wanted to do anything with me. You admitted that you, you killed your father. Yeah. Why did you do that? The world never approached me. They never told me I'm God. So you did this to get respect? I, I did this to get my name out there because how else am I going to get the attention of you know, your, yourself? You know, I'm a no one sitting up in Maine. And you also said in, in here, you, you told officers that you cut up the body, your father's body. Yeah, I had to dispose of him somehow. I mean, I'm not sick in the head. I just wanted him gone. I was going to bury him in the woods and uh, um, just put dirt over him and just cover everything up. No one know a thing. I some tough details to hear for sure. Smith is charged with murder. He's being held here at the Cumberland County Jail, uh, here at the Kennebec County Jail, without any bail option. A judge has ordered a mental health evaluation. We're live tonight in Augusta at the Kennebec County Jail. John Creso, CBS 13 News. And John, as you mentioned, Leroy Smith did face a judge for the first time today, and newly released court paperwork reveals even more disturbing details about this crime. CBS 13's Jana Barnello continues our team coverage. And Jana, what does that paperwork reveal? Kim, these court documents reveal where, how, and why. Leroy Smith has been talking a lot through this investigation, as you just saw in his interview with us. And as the court paperwork shows, a warning, though, these details are disturbing. Investigators say Smith confessed to everything, killing and cutting up his father in a bathtub and recording it. Smith told police he posted the video of the murder to YouTube and Twitter, but then deleted it. The next day, Smith allegedly dumped his father's body in 16 bags along Lincoln Street in Richmond. Court papers say he rented a carpet cleaner to clean up the crime scene. Now, as much as he spoke to police, Smith remained quiet in court today until an outburst leaving the courtroom and then again outside. I'm the Lord in the kingdom of heaven, Go. the father of light. What happened, okay. Leroy? They're holding my life as a lie. Been Hell's Angels property since I was born. Smith did not enter a plea today, but he did tell the judge that he understands the charges against him. Smith is being held without bail. Greg, back to you. All right, Jenna, thank you. Well, on a strange twist, Police in two towns say they are searching for explosive devices that Leroy Smith III may have planted. One search area is here in Gardner. It's along the uh, Kennard Street area. They're searching this area. The other side, just a few miles to the south, as we head down towards Richmond, it's in the train trestle area. Again, from Gardner to Richmond, that's where they've been looking. Investigators searching the woods near this train trestle. CBS 13's Catherine Underwood is joining us now live from Gardner. Catherine, crews have been out there. They've been able to find anything suspicious. 
Uh, Greg, it's the end of day three of this search and police tell us that they have found nothing suspicious, no evidence of any homemade bombs in these woods. Neighbors tell us they saw Smith walking this route right along Costello Road here several times over the past week. So police focus their ground searches on these small trails off of the main road today. They took that search to the air. Police took a good look from overhead, trying to find any areas of interest or evidence that may lead them to dangerous homemade explosives that Leroy Smith III claimed to have left behind. Police say Smith admitted to using the explosives to alert him to places with the least foot traffic so that he could camp or grow marijuana. Neighbors say there are a lot of popular trails through these woods and they would hate to see an innocent person get hurt. And I'd hate to think some little kids out there find it, you know, and think it's a toy or mm -hmm. don't know what it is and something bad happens. Well, if there's any explosives out there, I hope they find them. Police say if you are walking in the woods in this area at all, just be alert. They say those homemade bombs would consist of a uh, cardboard tube, duct tape, and some fishing line. If you see anything like that or anything suspicious, don't touch it. Call police right away. The search is over for today, but officials say they will reevaluate tomorrow morning. We're live in Gardner tonight. Catherine Underwood, CBS 13 News. Greg, back to you. And Catherine, we should point out to our viewers, John did attempt to ask Smith about those allegedly planted bombs, and the interview was interrupted before we had a chance to get to that. Catherine, thank you. Well, friends and family of the victim in this case are now raising money for his funeral. The Red Barn Restaurant in Augusta started a GoFundMe fundraising account for Leroy Smith Jr., who did not have life insurance. One of the restaurant's employees, Devin Smith, is the nephew of the victim and says they've raised $5,200 right now. That's $2,000 over their goal. It's been probably a day and a half now, and it, it's just unbelievable I, how the community can come together and get so much done. And it, it, it takes a big weight off our shoulders that we can just concentrate on the family. Now Smith says they will give that extra money to a charity or perhaps create a scholarship in that victim's name. Crews from more than a dozen towns and cities spend most of the day fighting a nasty outbreak of brush fires along some train tracks in Old Orchard Beach and Saco. All campers on fire. That video sent only to CBS 13 shows the moments just after the train went through as fire began spreading from the tracks to a nearby campground. CBS 13's Beth Jones is live now in Old Orchard Beach with the latest information. Beth? Yeah, Kim, we're actually live right here on Old Orchard Road and less than a quarter mile down the road behind me. You can see all those fire trucks uh, behind us. That is the direction of the campground, Wagon Wheel Campground, uh, where most of the major damage was done by this fire, that according to officials. Now, take a look at this aerial uh, video that uh, we have. Uh, this is a huge swath of land that's on fire. Officials say that that fire stretched the entire length of the train tracks in Old Orchard Beach to the Saco line and that at least 20 communities worth of first responders were here on scene, 75 firefighters, that according to Old Orchard Beach Chief John Glass. He also tells us they believe a train coming through the area gave off sparks that ignited the fire, igniting dry material and dry conditions around it. Glass said his crews were battling heat and very thick smoke. Take a listen. All the way down the track, there was smoke and fire conditions. There were a couple of condo complexes that were, uh, the fire was impinging on them, but never reached them. We were able to make stops to where we didn't lose any condos, but uh, it was uh, a very dangerous situation all along the track. Well, Chief Glass tells us that at least 10 trailers in the Wagon Wheel campground were destroyed, but he believes those trailers were unoccupied. More trailers were damaged than the 10 that were actually destroyed, and they say they have crews all the way up and down the tracks, keeping an eye on things to make sure none of those fires reignite. But he says for right now, they have everything under control. We're live here in Old Orchard Beach. Beth Jones, CBS 13 News, back to you. Certainly a lot of effort going into this tonight, Beth. Thanks. We have team coverage of these fires tonight. CBS 13's Marissa Bodner is joining us now live from Saco, where it is still an active scene right now, Marissa. 
Well, Greg, actually, uh, we thought it was still active. The chief brought us down here. He says, though, it was put out within the last 20 minutes or so. And this was one of the bigger sections of fire they had to fight today. Take a look behind me. You can see the charred hillside. They say it was about three acres inside. It took 40 firefighters to get it out. And fire officials say there is some property damage along the tracks. It's unclear the extent of that damage. One of the big problems they faced today, they said, was rail ties tossed aside along those tracks. Their wood, they're covered in oil and grease, so that certainly made things a little more difficult today. But take a look. This video just in. It was taken by a golfer at Dune Grass in Old Orchard Beach. You can see a helicopter picking up water from a golf pond. Some people I talked to today in some say they grabbed buckets themselves and helped put out some of the smaller fires. All in all, this has just been a huge fire for this area. Flames about six, seven feet high at parts, maybe bigger than those small ones, like two, three feet. This whole city of Saco was under smoke. It was horrible. I never seen anything like that in my life. Fire officials tell me they have walked the three-acre perimeter of this fire. They do feel confident that it's out at this point, but they say they'll be back tomorrow. Um, they say those uh, rail timbers along the tracks, those smolder very easily. They'll probably smolder overnight, and they say, you know, a cigarette, but the slightest wisp of smoke could be dangerous at this point. So, again, they'll be back tomorrow just to keep an eye on things. For now, live in Saco, Marissa Bodner, CBS 13 News. I'll send it back to you. Oh, it is good to here they've dealt with those hot spots they were dealing with in the last half hour, Marissa. Thank you. The threat of brush fires is not isolated to the Old Orchard Beach area. Charlie Lepresti joins us now with more on where the danger is highest and when we can expect some relief, Charlie. Well, Kim, conditions were perfect this afternoon for something as simple as just a few sparks from a train to cause those fires. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Maine Forest Service, I should say, is keeping the area in a Class 3 high fire danger. That's southern and coastal Maine. Let's take a look at that map from the Forest Service here. Uh, areas in yellow have a high fire danger. It's a moderate fire danger the farther inland you go. In fact, areas in the mountains still looking at some snow or some melt occurring up there where we're at a low fire danger. Dew points are very low right now. During the afternoon, we had relative humidities between 20 and 30 percent. So that's why we had fire problems during the afternoon. Now going forward, some improvement is expected. Some showers are likely tomorrow, improvement in the fire danger anyway, and those relative humidities will be on the increase. Coming up in a few minutes, I'm going to walk you through tomorrow's forecast, which includes a big cool down, of course, followed by a big warm up. Details in the seven eight if you can like that part. All right. Thanks, Charlie. Still ahead, a terrifying crash in Rochester when a car crashes right into a condo. The object that car narrowly missed that could have made the situation more tragic. And a family dog is shot and killed by a neighbor in West Paris. The reason the neighbor gave for doing it and what the dog's owner is saying about it coming up. This is CBS 13 News. A mother and son say they're lucky to be alive after a car smashes through their condominium last night. It happened in Rochester, New Hampshire. You can see the shattered glass and the gaping hole in the condo. John Martineau says he was in his bedroom when he heard a loud crash just before 10 last night. Yeah, I'm just lucky that no one was injured. I mean, that would have been a whole entire another dilemma if someone was killed or something, because that was definitely enough impact force to kill someone. Martineau came out to find a black Toyota Camry in the living room. The driver of that car, Mark Harmon, is a neighbor. He didn't want to speak on camera, but he tells us that he was pulling into his parking spot when his brakes went out. He says his car went over the hill, through the fence, and into the family's condo. Harmon says he feels terrible, but is thankful that no one was hurt. A West Paris man is facing cruelty to animal charges for shooting and killing his neighbor's dog. These are pictures of Jake, a 13-year-old boxer mix. The dog's owner, Kevin Newton, and animal control officer, Ozzie Hart, both say Newton's neighbor, Steve McCann, admitted to shooting the dog. They say McCann told them he thought it looked like a pit bull and didn't have a collar. They say McCann told them when he got his gun, the dog ran off, but he followed the dog and then shot it. It didn't uh, try to attack him or anything. It just stayed right, stayed right there by his house. And then when he got the gun out, didn't it try to run away? Yes, it did. But I guess Steve told him he shot him five times. The first shot didn't kill him, so he shot him four more. Kevin Newton says he found his dog's body, carried it home, and buried it there in his yard. Other neighbors tell us Jake was very friendly, wouldn't harm a fly. Steve McCann was not home and has not returned our calls.
Moose loose. A great day for a waterfront picnic, and apparently this moose thought so too. Now where this moose emerged and where it ended up going. And today was a nearly perfect spring day. Going forward, I'm tracking a cool down tomorrow, followed by a big warm up part of the weekend. Don't miss the forecast. It's up next. Now, your weather authority forecast with Charlie DePresti. Well, today was a simply gorgeous spring day. We had highs in the 60s and 70s. Just a few high thin clouds are spilling over this evening. A look at our Old Orchard Beach Pier Cam time lapse, catch of the tide uh, on the increase or Moving up high tide right now. In fact, we're looking at a few high increasing clouds during the late afternoon hours. So it was a gorgeous day. A live look right now from our Raymond Sky Cam out over Panther Pond. Sort of a milky appearance to the sky. Some of those clouds will continue to increase tonight and thicken up during the day tomorrow. Notice the snow covered peaks there of the presidential range back in New Hampshire. In fact, the temperature on Mount Washington now is up to 37 degrees. They are above the freezing mark. That's good news. A little bit of snow is melting up on the observation deck at the uh, Sherman Adams building at Mount Washington State Park. For the rest of us, though, we're cooling off a little bit in the upper 30s now at the coastline. We topped out in the upper 60s today. What a perfect day, right? Upper 60s for coastal towns. Some inland communities are still showing off with temps in the 60s to near 70 degrees. Where do we go from here? Well, tomorrow will feature thickening clouds with a chance for an afternoon shower. A good chunk of the day tomorrow will feature just dry conditions. Our brightest skies will be during the morning hours. A few showers are likely on Saturday as well. There's a chance for a thunderstorm, and it will be mild. Highs that day should make it back into the 60s, and the payoff day will be Mother's Day itself. Full sunshine and even warmer conditions return that day, with many towns warming into the 70s. So Sunday will be the pick of the weekend. Again, increasing or thickening clouds out there this evening, courtesy of a warm front approaching from the southwest. That warm front is situated right in here. Now, the air mass behind this front is significantly warmer. Look at this air mass back to the uh, Pennsylvania area down through the Ohio Valley. They're in the 80s down there. It looks like a piece of that warmth will try to get in here on Saturday. The big question is, can we break out of the clouds, at least for a brief period? If we can, we're going to warm it to near 70. This is 7 a.m. tomorrow. If we see any sun, it's during the early morning hours. We'll have thickening clouds throughout the day. With a few spotty showers by afternoon. Temps will be a solid 15 degrees cooler than where we, they were today. Highs will stay in the 50s tomorrow. I think 60s return on Saturday. This is the morning hours. Notice the chance for a brief shower. If we see any sun, it's probably midday or afternoon with highs making it back into the 60s to possibly near 70 degrees. Here comes the cold front. There's the chance for a shower, even the slight chance for a thunderstorm by afternoon. This is 4 o'clock in the afternoon Saturday, and again, full sun returns Sunday with many towns warming into the 70s. Looks pretty nice to end out the weekend, and mothers will be happy this weekend, of course. Mother's Day on Sunday will feature highs in the low 70s, upper 60s on Monday. There could be a few showers around here on Tuesday. The difference between coastal areas and inland communities, you'll just be a little bit warmer over inland towns in the coming days for daytime highs and a little bit cooler for overnight lows. So today was a great day, guys. Yeah. Of course, tomorrow we're taking a few steps backwards, but by the weekend, it's looking a little bit better. Just a few showers Saturday. Just clear okay. it out by Sunday. That's <laughs> all we care. Right? Sunday looks very nice. All guys. right, thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. The Bruins and Canadians are set to face off in game four tonight. The three keys for Boston that should add up to a Bruins winner. The Sea Dogs have their ace on the mound right now, but we're talking Patriots. What Shane Vereen has to say about tonight's draft. Next in sports. Now, News 13 Sports with Davey. Good evening, everyone. After 30 games, our Portland Sea Dogs are sitting atop the Eastern Division. Tonight, the New Hampshire Fisher Cats are in town to open up a four-game series. But that's only half the story tonight. CBS 13's Evans Boston joins us now live from Hadlock with much more. And Evans, uh, tonight's game already underway. You got it right, Dave. Uh, Henry Owens, the Red Sox top prospect, is on the hill right now. No score in the second inning between the Sea Dogs and the Fisher Cats. But the big story here was pregame, more likely the first pitch. Patriots running back Shane Vereen was here to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. The Pats running back in town to sign a few autographs and uh, also talk to us about the NFL draft, which starts tonight. Vereen says, just like us, he is uh, completely clueless about what the Pats are going to do. Tonight's, uh, you know, the opening night of the NFL draft. Um, everyone wants to know what the Patriots are going to do. So I know you know. Tell us what they're oh, going to yeah. do. Uh, I know nothing. <laughs> I know just as much as, uh, you know, some little lady down in Texas. Literally, we don't know. It's a wait and see type game. I'm excited for all the guys. I mean, I remember what it was like being in there, um, being in their shoes. And so it's an exciting time for them. 
Varine, of course, was a second round draft pick for the Patriots. Uh, very, very nice guy. He's signing autographs as we speak. Full highlights of the Sea Dogs game tonight on CBS 13 News at 11. Dave, the Sea Dogs bus broke down last night. They didn't get in until 2 a.m. So much for a getaway game. Uh, absolutely. Get the coffee ready. All right, Evans, great job. Well, it's not a must win for the Bruins tonight, but it's the closest thing. The Bees and Canadians facing off in game four at the Bell Center with Montreal leading the series two games to one. The Bruins have yet to really play Bruins hockey for a full 60 minutes. The Bees would like to have a faster start tonight, get physical from the get-go, and get more traffic in front of Carey Price. One thing is for certain, the Bruins aren't panicking or pointing fingers. I just think our team has to play better. It's not Jerome, it's not this guy or that guy. Our team has to play better. That's how we succeed. Okay, and, uh, and Jerome's part of that group. But uh, again, I, I don't really spend too much time focusing on one guy. I, I spend a lot of time focusing on our team. Well, the Patriots are reportedly trying to trade backup quarterback Ryan Mallett to the Houston Texans. Meanwhile, the NFL draft kicks off later tonight with round one only. Rounds two and three will be Friday night with the rest of the draft finishing up on Saturday. Patriots have eight picks in all, at least for right now. The uh, Pats first rounder is the 29th overall pick. Patriots also have uh, a second rounder, a third rounder, two in the fourth, two in the sixth, and one in the seventh. What the Patriots plan on doing with those picks is anyone's <laughs> guess. One thing is for sure, they don't need a starting quarterback. No, nope. that's, that's all I can out. tell you. Good to know. <laughs> Knock on wood. Yes. That's going to take a while, that draft. Oh, that, yeah, it's going to take a long The first round takes forever. Uh -huh. They may not. We may not know the Pats pick until maybe uh, after the uh, 11 o'clock news. Okay, right. well, you'll tell we'll us, see. I'm sure. Uh, we will. And we'll be right back with a final check on your forecast and a moose on the loose. Mm -hmm. Stay with us. This is CBS 13 News. This was a great day for a picnic lunch along the waterfront, and apparently this moose in Bath had the same idea. <laughs> yeah, this is video shared with us today by Melissa and Michael Christensen. Take a look. This is right along the Kennebec River there. They say the moose swam out of the river, popped up on shore, and then ran right off towards the downtown. Bath police tell CBS 13 News that the moose ran around some residential neighborhoods for about 15 minutes before finally going back into the woods. Mm. Don't blame him. <laughs> Good day for a swim, I guess, for your moose. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Mm. Boy, nice weather, Charlie, mm. today and maybe a little downward That's tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Just a little bit, though. Tomorrow we head downhill in the 50s for highs, so a solid 15 degrees cooler than where we were today, but we're back on the upswing by Saturday. Chance for a shower, a thunderstorm. Sunday is the payoff day. 70s return for everyone. Can't wait to remember what that feels like. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Have a great night. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here later tonight.